and you are listening to Democracy Now! As we turn now to part two of our special with legendary civil rights singer Sweet Honey in the Rock. Since 1973, Sweet Honey in the Rock has reinvented a cappella music and introduced a generation to the roots of African American music gospel, spirituals, and hymns, as well as blues and jazz. The Grammy Award winning group has released 18 albums and has toured the world. This year, they're celebrating their 30th anniversary together. It was 1973 when Bernice Johnson Regan brought together the group of female singers to form this a cappella group. At the time, Dr. Regan was the music director of the old D.C. Black Repertory Theater Company. The first song they practiced was called Sweet Honey in the Rock. The tune referenced a religious parable that spoke of a land so rich that when rocks were cracked open, honey flowed from them. On this 30th anniversary of Sweet Honey in the Rock, Dr. Bernice Johnson Regan will be moving on from the group. But we gather them together in our firehouse studio for an hour. Would you have me? Would I have you? Would you harbor me? Sweet Honey in the Rock, the legendary musical group live in our firehouse studios. Bernice Johnson Regan, Isai Maria Barnwell, Aisha Khalil, Carol Maylard, Natanju Balade Castle, and Shirley Childress Johnson is the signer today and a regular part of the group. Isai Maria Barnwell, can you talk about this song? Would you harbor me? When I wrote this song, originally it was actually for a dance theater piece. And it started with a discussion about slavery and how people, what people needed to do in order to escape if that's the, the path they decided to choose. And one of the things that we looked at was the fact that there were safe havens um, of some form along a path that people could stop at if it was safe 
and that there was a system that actually began to emerge that would move people or help people move from point to point. And we looked at today and what safe houses are there for people today. In the case of women who are abused, sometimes there are shelters. Sometimes there are welcoming communities that will harbor people who are fleeing from political oppression. Um, and so the question really comes uh, to each one of us, what is our particular role? Would I, if you were to come to my door in need of safe harbor, would I open my door given all the concerns that we have in today's society and let you in. And if I were to come to your door, would you do the same for me? And the song really is a litany of all of the, not all, of some of the possible people, kinds of people, who could come and knock at your door? Very often I find some people will agree on one or two in the entire list, but it's very rare that you can get people to agree on more than just one or two in the list. Can you talk about how you came to the group? Um, I came to the group quite unexpectedly. <laughs> I, um, I, I was signing and singing in church, the only time that I've ever done that. And uh, on that Sunday morning, it happened that Bernice was at that service. I think she hadn't planned to be there. And when the service was over, she came to me and said, I'm Bernice Johnson Regan. Yes, I know. I'm sweetheart. Yes, I know. And she said, well, we're looking for another member. Would you come to an audition starting tomorrow? And I thought surely she was talking to somebody else, but I said, okay, sure. And I went and for a month auditioned with the group, learned a number of songs, and during that process tried to explain to the group why I could not be both an interpreter and a singer in the group. And then I needed to make a decision about which I felt I wanted to do. And I chose to sing and at that point invited Shirley to come and, and be uh, an interpreter for the group. So I didn't ever think I would be singing as a way of living. Well, Shirley is speaking for herself in a different way right now, Shirley Childress Johnson, who is the signer of the group. But can you talk about Sweet Honey and the relationship um, with those who can't hear, who need to um, have the song conveyed in a, in a different way and why that is such an integral part of your group? Um, deafness has always been an interest of mine. When I was about uh, 11 years old, I saw The Miracle Worker on Broadway, which is the story of Helen Keller and her teacher, Annie Sullivan. And I went into speech pathology because I wanted to be a miracle worker. <laughs> Never worked with a deaf child or adult um, until years later when I decided that I really wanted to just learn the language and understand the culture. At that same time, when I was 11 or 12, I met a deaf girl. And it was really important to have that experience because I grew up in a world not only with sound like many of us, but I came from a musical family. So it was really hard for me to imagine having a playmate or a friend who couldn't hear the music that I was hearing. And um, from that point up? on, in New York City. So from that point on, I think it became very important. So when I got into Sweet Honey and they were looking for someone to interpret music to people who couldn't hear, that was like a fulfillment of a dream that had started when I was 11 or 12. Um, and one that just has been evolving ever since. We have an ever-growing uh, community now, community uh, of people who come to Sweet Honey concerts because the music is made accessible by Shirley, who is one of the finest interpreters in this country um, and who is capable really of interpreting not only the words, not only the poetry, but the rhythm, the emotion, and the cultural expression of the music, which is very, very important. You know, we're used to seeing interpreters in a confined space, you, you know, usually not taking up very much space. Shirley takes up a lot of space and is very rhythmic and very, <laughs> and we love her. <laughs> 
is I, Maria Barnwell, and the Sweet Honey and the Rock Civil Rights Musical Group. We'll be back with them in a minute. Down in the Valley, two by two, our Sweet Honey in the Rock special here on Democracy Now!'s War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman as we return to our Firehouse Studios with the Civil Rights Acapella Group. Dr. Bernice Johnson Regan, can you talk about how you educate people? I mean, we're recording this today in between concerts you're doing for children. And that is a big part of what you do. Not every group does that. But you weave in history and spirituals, education through music and culture. Can you talk about how you talk about the terror? If you are born into a situation and in order to help you stay alive, your parents teach you if you are a young black boy n never to look a white man in the eye or if you're walking down a sidewalk and there's a white person walking toward you, you step to the side or off the sidewalk. Um, there is a process that terror creates where a whole culture is constructed so that you socialize people to live in twisted, distorted ways. And in our contemporary sense, we are thinking about terror uh, in terms of a plane that's turned into a bomb or somebody who sends uh, something in an envelope through the postal system. And we think of everything else that might be uncomfortable as not that. But I think it's very important to understand that there is an American history with terrorizing its own citizens that's held in the legacy of African Americans. And it is palpable and it continues. Uh, families wonder how they can get their young boys to the age of 35 without being killed. How, how do you um, teach a child how to deal with a police who's operating out of a police culture that says you really can shoot and kill and work it out because the system of justice is not going to give justice to the person you have killed. It is going to actually ask the jury to put themselves in the place of the police when the police was looking at this black person. So uh, terror is palpable. We are from Washington, D.C., and we had this thing with snipers. And uh, these snipers were not killing what you would call just like, you know, them, those guns, they get those guns and chur, like the post office thing. You know, you go into the post office, you go. Brrr. 
they were just like picking off one here, one there, different categories. And soon everybody in that region felt that every time you walked out of your house, there was a gun to your head. And that it's very important to not make terror of that thing that those people do to you from way over there. And in terms of this sniper, this was Washington, D.C., but initially there was no voice from the federal government about the paralysis that dropped over that region because they didn't have any room for domestic terror because they were trying to draw our attention to enemies that came from some evil they were constructing from the outside. So terror is not simple in our culture because in our culture it's political.